was a discographer with me. This is, this is my job. So from 1910 to 2010, the global Christian percentage does almost nothing. Almost nothing. So you have Christians are about 35% of the population in 1910. They're about 33% of the population in 2010. This is my very exciting job. Um, but within that very boring flat line, there have been enormous changes in Christianity, which I'm sure you were all aware of. Looking at the percentage of Christians who live in the Global South, and here I'm defining Global South as Asia, Africa, Latin America, these are UN designations. We don't make up our own country or region designations. We use the United Nations. So in 1910, 18% of Christians lived in the Global South. By 1970, 42%, 41.3% of Christians lived in the Global South, so that's a lot more. And by 2020, we anticipate that 64.7% of Christians will likely live in the Global South. That is an enormous shift of Christianity. People talk about the shift of Christianity in the Global South all the time. I'm sure you've heard that before. Um, but looking at the numbers, I feel like, because I like numbers, really drives it home. That from 1910, 18% to 2020, almost 65% living in the global south. If you like maps, like me, here's a map of Christianity in 1910. So the darker the blue, the higher concentration of Christians, and the lighter the blue, um, the, the, the fewer Christians. So you can see that in 1910, uh, we have Oceania, uh, Latin America, North America, and Europe. Um, in Asia, Africa, uh, not very Christian. But by 2010, so make sure you don't blink when I hit the clicker. This is what it looks like. I'm going to go back and forth a couple of times so you can kind of take that in. I would say check out Sub Saharan Africa. There's 1910, and there's 2010. And also check out Europe and the United States, or in North America, as it goes from almost as dark as can be to much lighter. And also check out China, going from yellow to quite a bit of blue. And one more time for South Korea, which is also yellow to blue. So that means the growth of Christianity in those places. Um, one thing here, you see on this map, we have a dot for 1910, a dot for 2010. This is what we call the statistical center of gravity. So around those dots, there's an equal number of Christians to the north, south, east, west of that point. So that means in 1910, the statistical center of gravity was in Europe. So there's an equal number of Christians in the world around that point in Europe. But by 2010, it's in Timbuktu, Mali, which is a Muslim city, um, ironically. Looking at it a different way, if you happen to like the numbers, here are pie graphs for the percentage of Christians living in the various uh, continents in 1910-2010. You see that 66% lived in Europe, but only 25.6% lived in Europe by 2010. So again, there's different ways of saying the same thing that Christianity has shifted to the global south. Looking at the top 10 countries with the most Christians, you see that in 1910, the only country on the list in the Global South is Brazil. But by 2010, you have seven of the top 10 countries with the most Christians are in the Global South. So this has enormous implications for how we relate to one another, for what it means to be Christian, for what it looks like to be Christian, for the kind of theology going on, for the kind of Christian peacemaking going on. This, this demographic shift has implications for both Northern and Southern Christians. So, one thing that I think a lot about in terms of ecumenism is what the whole church is. So, doing religious demography, Christian demography, if you want to call it that, we consider the whole church. And we do this as a, by the method of self-identification. If you call yourself a Christian, we consider you a Christian. Just plain and simple. Sociology, sociological concepts, self-identification. So we include Catholics, Orthodox, Protestant, Independents, Anglicans, and what we call marginals, which is a category we actually have since gotten rid of, uh, since the data is from the Atlas, have been included here. Uh, marginals include traditions, um, they're generally non sectarian, uh, but we still self identify as Christian. So, thinking about the whole church, it includes all Christian traditions and totals 2.3 billion people in 2010. 
Now some trends within that. Here's a little cartoon. Uh, this is Sunday school. Churches and Christian movements throughout history. You can see all the front, the divisions between Christianity and this little one here. So this is where our movement came along and finally got the Bible right. <laughs> and this guy looks like a monkey. Uh, I'm not sure why. Jesus is so lucky to have us. So this is a, a picture of what some might call the fragmentation of global Christianity. We track that there are 41,000 Christian denominations in 2010. That's a lot. That's a lot of denominations. Um, Within that, South Korea alone has 400 denominations. Um, and we actually, as we speak, have student workers frantically translating Korean to uh, see if there are any more we missed. Um, and there, there very well might be. Uh, so this is something that's come up a lot in these meetings, is this fragmentation of Christianity. Um, and I want to challenge us to think about whether this is a good thing or a bad thing or a neutral thing. I'm going to leave that question out. Um, another trend within global Christianity that's important for us to think about is the growth of Pentecostal and evangelical movements. So, Pentecostals, Charismatics, and Independent Charismatics, a group that we call Renewalists, they've grown at nearly four times the growth rate of global Christianity. It's the fastest growing uh, expression of Christianity in the world today, are Pentecostal and evangelical movements. Um, in 1970, uh, Renewalists were only 5% of all Christians, but by 2010 they were 25%. So a quarter of all Christians in the world are Pentecostals. Um, and this is over 600 million people. Uh, and then evangelicals have grown from 98 million in 1970 to 300 million in 2010. And by other definitions of other people have been evangelicals, it's even higher. Uh, but based on our definition, there's about 300 million. Uh, so again, this has enormous implications for groups like the WCC that's trying to consider the relationship between uh, ecumenism and Pentecostalism. Looking at it uh, in terms of a map, you see that there's almost nothing going on in terms of uh, renewalist movements in 1910 except for South Africa, but by 2010, it's all over. It's all over. Let's go back and forth, just check out China. There's nothing going on there. And you'll see, if you remember from the Christian map, 1910 to 2010, it looks the same. So most of the growth of Christianity in China is these charismatic, Pentecostal, regalist movements. And if you want to look at the numbers, um, similar pie graphs, most uh, Pentecostals were in Africa, but now they seem to be evenly spreading out around the world. I included all of you, don't get thrown off by all these numbers, I know people don't like numbers, um, but what I, I included this here, these are all the major traditions, and it shows that there are Pentecostals in all of these traditions. So there are Pentecostal Anglicans, and Pentecostal Catholics, and Pentecostal Independents, and Pentecostal Orthodox, um, Charismatic Orthodox. So this is not a movement exclusive to Protestantism or exclusive to independent churches. This is something that's permeating all of global Christianity. So it's important for us to remember. So moving on to the Asian context. So I included this just so you can see what I mean when I'm talking about Asia. These are UN regions. So it's the regions of Southeastern Asia, it's called this, Eastern Asia, South Central Asia, which includes India and all the stands, and then Western Asia. Uh, the Middle East is not a UN region, so I'm not going to talk about the Middle East per se, uh, but I will be talking about Western Asia. So that's that region there. You can see the countries there. If you're looking for your home country, you can see where it falls when I'm talking about what region. I think before talking about Christian demographics, it's always important to look at the religious context. Everyone knows that Asia is the most religiously diverse major area in the world. And I love the Asia map because it's pretty. Christian map is boring, it's just blue. But the Asia map is fun because it has all different colors. So you see India is 1910, obviously it's Hindu. We have Muslims in uh, Western Asia. We have, this is actually Chinese folk religion, um, kind of where we use Buddhism. Um, Philippines is Christian by 1910. Uh, and then the brown is what we call ethno-religious. And so this is what religion in Asia looks like in, in 1910. Let's see what happens between 1910 and 2010. Don't blink. Uh, not much, right? Get the, so here's 1910, here's 2010. It looks almost the same, with some notable exceptions of China, which is all Chinese folk religionists, to majority agnostic 
because of the, the rice communism there and same folks atheism. And then also our beloved Korea is blue. Um, and Indonesia goes from ethno-religious to Muslim. Indonesia is the largest Muslim country in the world right now. So within that, let's look at the changes of Christianity. So here's what Christianity looked like in Asia. Check out where the blue is. And here's what Christianity in Asia looks like now. So, back forth. so let's look at Western Asia. You have some blue in Turkey and those countries there. It's essentially gone by then. And then you also have China going from nothing to something and also throughout Southeast Asia here. At the same time, so we have, we have uh, Asian Christianity. Asian, or Christians are only 8.5% of Asia's population right now. That's not a lot, especially when Asia is almost half the global population. We only have 8.5% 8, 8 Christian. It's not a lot. But the paradox of Asian Christianity is that one of the world's largest churches is in Asia. And everyone knows this church is right, beautiful gospel church, but I've seen these pictures. And Asia is home to the second largest missionary sending country in the world, uh, by, which, which is South Korea. Um, but if you look at it per capita, then, yes. <laughs> if you look at it per capita, so by per million population, South Korea is the largest missionary sending country in the world from the least Christian area of the world. This is the paradox of Asian Christianity. And Asia is home to some of the fastest growing Christian communities in the world. So in Cambodia, Mongolia, Timor, and Nepal, these places where Christian population is growing upwards of 7% per year. That's an 